So for the first learning module of chapter three, we'll refresh some basic definitions from chapter one of the course. The first is the idea of a particle. And the key point that I want you to um, kind of recall here is that when you hear the term particle, although you naturally may assume that that implies that a body is physically small, what it really means is that for the particular loading conditions or the forces that a body is subjected to, that from a modeling point of view, we can get away with ignoring the physical dimensions of the actual body. We can model it just as a point. And uh, practically speaking, as we'll see in a bit more detail when we get to subsequent chapters, uh, what that means is that the loading of the particular body causes it not to have any tendency to rotate. So if you think about this pen, I could never do it, particularly tired as I am now, my hands are kind of shaky. But if I were to exert a contact force that counterbalance the weight of this pen perfectly, then for all practical purposes, I could determine that um, resultant force that I'm applying to balance the pen by just modeling the pen as a single point in space. However, if I were to model it instead using supports under each side, then any one of those individual forces would tend to cause the body to rotate. So when you start to get into the ideal of moments acting upon a rigid body, that's going to be something that we do down the road. It's going to add mathematical complexity. So wherever we can get away with treating an object as a particle, uh, we will. But the key point that I was trying to emphasize there in that example is the second bullet point that the same body, sometimes it may be suitable to model it as a particle. And sometimes we have to model it as a rigid body, just depending upon the nature of the loading system that is acting upon that body. Uh, particularly, the, that example also emphasizes the, the third point in my bullets, where we're definitely going to be able to model things as particle when the force system acting upon that body is concurrent. And what that means is if I consider the line of actions of each of the forces acting upon the body, they all intersect at a single point. So here we kind of have a two-dimensional drawing of a cylinder that's kind of being suspended on an inclined plane by pulling it up through this cable. And we'll notice that the arrangement of the cable, if I were to draw the line of action of that um, kind of tension or tensile force that we'll define more formally later, that's being exerted on the cylinder, kind of counterbalancing its weight and not causing it to roll down the plane, it goes right through the center of mass of the cylinder. Uh, in addition, of course, we would model, we haven't talked about it yet, but we model the weight of the cylinder as a vector going downward towards the center of the earth, uh, uh, applied at its center of mass. So by definition, that goes through the center of mass as well. And um, this normal force that's being exerted by the surface on the actual cylinder also goes through the center of mass as well. So in this scenario, although this cylinder, it definitely has a diameter from a modeling point of view, I can just draw what we'll see later on in the chapter is known as my free body diagram and model the cylinder just as a point because all the forces are concurrent. In addition, just a refresher on equilibrium. Equilibrium is just a fancy way to say that the acceleration is zero. If you remember your calculus along with your basic physical kinematics, acceleration is the temporal derivative or time rate of change of the velocity. So uh, it can be zero, of course, if the velocity is zero, in which case that would mean that the position isn't changing or the body is at rest. However, if I have a body that is moving under constant velocity, since the uh, derivative of a constant is zero, uh, equilibrium also applies in that scenario as well. So just to uh, kind of refresh what the governing formula is, Remember that uh, Newton's second law relates the resultant force acting on a body to its, its acceleration. Specifically, that resultant force is going to be proportional to the acceleration, where the proportionality constant is the mass. So if acceleration is zero, then we know that the resultant forces add vectorially to zero, which is to say, basically, in two dimensions, that the pull to the right is canceled out by the pull to the left, the pull up is canceled out by the pull down, and uh, if you have an extra dimension there, that same thing holds, and uh, that will allow the body not to accelerate, and hopefully all those definitions are just refreshers. Your book is kind of really weird in the sense that it defines a bunch of, if you remember, if you watched the, uh, the videos from the first chapter, I was kind of making fun of the fact that many of the terms that they introduced, uh, you, you kind of aren't ready to absorb them yet at that point uh, in the text, but hopefully uh, we're going to keep hitting this over the remainder of the semester, and by the end you'll just naturally be able to recognize, uh, hey, particle doesn't mean small, it means I can ignore 
the uh, kind of spatial dimensions of the body, uh, know the two scenarios of equilibrium, and so on.